A warm welcome at Hyde Park. We thought of talking a little about uh, the United Kingdom and Sri Lanka today. Of course, with the United Kingdom on the headlines continuously uh, with Brexit, we'd like to talk about uh, more plans for Sri Lanka UK to enhance trade relations and also uh, the British High Commissioner who will be completing his tenure in Sri Lanka at the um, mid this month. Um, let me warmly welcome the British High Commissioner to Sri Lanka, James Doris. Thank you very much. It's nice to be back on the programme. It's lovely to have you. I think this is, um, we, we had you uh, quite recently on the programme and it's nice to have you once again. Um, four and a half years in Sri Lanka. You've been doing a lot of work here to promote Sri Lanka UK relations and um, there are a lot of observations you've been making within uh, these past four and a half years. Um, and you'd be leaving uh, the island on the 15th, if I'm not mistaken. I will, yes. And uh, wh what will your next uh, posting be? I'm off back to London. I'll be working in our foreign ministry in London. It's um, quite a long time since I had a full-time job in London. It's uh, 2005, 14 years ago. Wow. I, I came here from being ambassador to Peru after, and I was in Peru and Colombia for nine years in South America in total. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So no, returning to London at an exciting time in British politics as well as an exciting time in Sri Lankan politics. Certainly, uh, that would be a good time for you to be uh, there in London. But let's talk a little about your uh, term here in Sri Lanka, four and a half years. Uh, of course, last time at Hyde Park on the very same programme, we spoke about areas you think Sri Lanka should uh, look at to enhance um, relations, not just with the, the UK, but other superpowers too. And also certain ways in which Sri Lanka should uh, mitigate uh, challenges in the global economy. Um, let's take a look at look back at your work here and what Sri Lanka has been doing. That's a big question. And if I answer the question, ask, my, ask myself the question, uh, how where has Sri Lanka moved forwards? The answer is easy. The answer is in lots of areas. Um, I think if one looks simply at the physical infrastructure of the country and looks at how much uh, gold face green has changed, it's almost unrecognisable just from four and a half, five years ago. Uh, as we look at the, the towers and the tourist infrastructure uh, that's coming up there. I think it's interesting also how it's changed in terms of governance. Um, I've spent a lot of my time here uh, talking about and working on issues around reconciliation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something both the British government but also I personally believe to be uh, important. And I look at the uh, setting up of an office on reparations and an office for missing persons uh, and despite the problems and despite many people's ambition for things to have gone more quickly, I look back and I do see important progress having been made. Uh, and I think that's important. It's important because uh, as I look, for example, at our experience in Northern Ireland and the challenge of bringing communities back together again after decades of conflict, uh, so too uh, here in Sri Lanka, I think that the uh, best interests of every community uh, lies in a lasting peace, lasting reconciliation uh, being put in place because peace is uh, the best guarantee we have um, of not least future prosperity for everybody. Uh, so you're particularly uh, satisfied with the kind of progress Sri Lanka has made in terms of peace reconciliation, is that so? I think that's, um, I think that's encouraging. I look at other areas as well. I look, for example, at the uh, developments here in the uh, right to information, the change to the constitution that has established the right to information as a fundamental right. Uh, and I look, or I, I look at the figures uh, for the, uh, that show how much use people are now making of that right. Uh, and I think that's um, encouraging. Um, I look, I think back to when I first arrived here, back to April 2015, uh, and I think of the fears that people had then, that, and they were real fears, uh, that people were moving on from about the possibility of uh, state actors taking extra legal uh, actions uh, against them in some cases. And I do see an important rebalancing of people's confidence uh, that the state and state actors will not be uh, taking steps outside the law, outside the proper framework uh, for action, which I think is another very positive uh, step forward which people across the country uh, have had good reason to continue to welcome throughout my time here. Um, talking about good governance, transparency, um, this is something that the UK has constantly been concerned and interested about in Sri Lanka some four or five years ago too. Um, with the changes that were made over time, 
Uh, do you see any progress made in the areas of good governance, transparency, particularly uh, in, in, uh, inside the country? We've been working hard as the UK to help develop uh, the capacities, uh, for example, of the uh, Attorney General's Office and CIABOC, the Commission, uh, the Anti-Bribery -Anti and Corruption Commission. Uh, we've been doing this at their request, bringing UK experts here to Sri Lanka to share our ideas, our ideas about best practice. Mm -hmm. Equally, I look across the country and talking to talk to normal people in the streets here in Colombo and elsewhere where, I, where, where I've travelled, uh, I get a sense, sense of frustration that greater progress uh, has uh, not been made. Uh, and I think that is a mark of the importance that uh, your average voter out on the street attaches to the, uh, to the issue of good, transparent government. What challenges do you see here uh, when you say uh, the, the greater uh, part of uh, achieving good governance and uh, transparency is not achieved uh, within the country, although that was uh, the concern of the United Kingdom and many Western countries, and also that was something uh, that people of the country voted for? I understand, I think we all understand the political difficulty uh, around uh, delivering certain objectives. They're reasonably easy to describe, they're easy to put down on paper. Uh, actually delivering uh, answers uh, can be much more difficult for a range of reasons. I think what is admirable uh, is the determination of so many capable, uh, capable people to take it forward. Uh, to give you a slightly different example, uh, last week I was talking at the launch of the Sri Lanka branch of the Institute of Arbitrators. It's the Institute's 40th branch in the world. I think it's exciting that they're coming here. And what the Chartered Institutes offer is, is essentially one of developing alternative dispute resolution. And I use my speech to talk about the role that the judiciary and lawyers have in delivering speedy justice. Uh, because everyone uh, will agree that uh, a speedy justice, appropriately, not inappropriately quick, but uh, a, quick, a quick movement through the courts is in people's interests in, in civil and commercial litigation. Um, last time we met here at Hyde Park, uh, this was shortly um, after the horrific Easter Sunday attacks. Um, we spoke about a lot that had happened, that should have happened, should not have happened, and uh, measures that should have been taken. Um, and as Sri Lanka has launched an investigation, an ongoing investigation into uh, where we went wrong, what should have been done in terms of security arrangements and uh, uh, intelligence information that was here. Uh, let's let's look at these um, ongoing investigations. What concerns does the United Kingdom have so far? If I can begin by uh, making a point I made last time, which is one of praise, praise for the uh, emergency services, the hospitals, uh, the, the, the police and others who were involved in the immediate response to uh, the attacks. Uh, and I think people were, were impressed by the professionalism of the response that they saw in the aftermath of the attacks. Clearly, since we last spoke, a lot of thought has continued uh, to be given uh, to what needs to be done to help reassure citizens, not least, that if intelligence of a similar sort uh, or, or intelligence about a similar sort of attack uh, were to become available again, uh, that appropriate action would be taken quickly. And we've had uh, UK experts uh, here, and we are very happy to share uh, advice drawing on our own experience of terrorist attacks in the UK, and we've had an unfortunate number of them. Um, one thing that we've learned is about the importance of uh, putting in place structures that allow uh, different agencies in the country to pool the information that they have in order to uh, lead the people who are having to take decisions uh, to, in order to give them access to, uh, to, to what is known from lots of different sources. Uh, so part one is internal and then the second part, particularly when we're looking at an international threat like modern terrorism is today, uh, is the value that comes, the need to uh, collaborate with trusted international partners. Because it's only often by putting together the pieces that different uh, international uh, actors will have that you can form a reliable and timely picture about uh, the nature of the challenge that you yourself are facing.
Mm -hmm. um, we talking about the collaboration between international partners and uh, Sri Lankan law enforcement authorities. This was something that was on the news continuously because of concerns raised by um, international investigators um, and uh, certain partners in Sri Lanka. Uh, has there been any continued collaboration post uh, the, the the immediate aftermath of the Easter attacks with UK investigators and uh, also to add? something to that question about uh, the progress I'd really like to know what what kind of um, coordination or collaboration there has been uh, between the governments of the United Kingdom and uh, Sri Lanka in terms of the progress uh, of these investigations very shortly after the attacks um, our then uh, junior minister state minister for home affairs was here in Colombo and he came in order to demonstrate the seriousness of the UK, UK government's commitment to uh, working with the Sri Lankan authorities uh, in confronting a problem which was, uh, had clearly had tragic consequences here. Uh, since the, uh, our new Prime Minister uh, was, uh, was chosen and uh, took office, uh, the, the minister who came here is now our Defence Minister. Um, so it's nice uh, for, for us that he has already been to Sri Lanka uh, and has an understanding of both the country and the importance of uh, this issue. Um, the, so I, I think on the, on the collaboration front, what I can say is that, uh, yes, we are still talking and we will continue to talk and we continue to remain willing to uh, share experience, um, ideas, uh, and to uh, help the Sri Lankan authorities where that help is wanted. Uh, ensure that they are able to respond appropriately and in a timely manner to future threats. Uh, there has been, uh, uh, they have been open to the idea of collaboration in terms of international partners, uh, but has there been any challenges in working together? It always takes time to get to know each other, uh, but no, I think the key to the key to collaboration is uh, trust on both sides and an ambition to work together on both sides, and where both of those are, are in place. Uh, and, and, there's, and there's plenty of each, uh, is my sense here, between Sri Lanka and the UK, then it's easy to move a relationship on. Certainly. Um, well, you'd be heading back to, like you said, a very challenging time uh, there in the UK with uh, uh, Brexit happening and uh, in Sri Lanka too. Uh, we're just about uh, talking about <laughs> elections, presidential elections and delayed uh, provincial polls, as well as um, general elections that have to be held at some point after these major elections too. Um, what is the UK's view about uh, the ongoing scenario? Because democracy is something that the UK has continued to speak of. And the right to vote, delayed elections in Sri Lanka. And of course, now we have to have a presidential poll. Um, w what kind of view does the United Kingdom hold here? It's, in some ways, it's rather a, uh, rather a sad time to be leaving Sri Lanka as you look forward to so many elections uh, <laughs> coming up over the next uh, few months. I mean, there are clearly different elections taking place. You, you mentioned the uh, provincial mm -hmm. uh, elections. Uh, holding elections to timetables is an important part of, uh, of democratic process in democracies. Uh, and I think in my time here, it's um, unfortunate that we're now in a position where in all nine provinces of Sri Lanka, the lead responsibility uh, for uh, moving forward, uh, the powers of, of, of uh, provincial government are in the hands of uh, unelected officials when the intention was to uh, have elected officials or elected officers in those uh, roles. Um, I think the, the question about um, division of powers is clearly a completely separate one. And that is that has gone to the core of the debate that has been taking place during much of my time in Sri Lanka um, around um, how you might change the constitution. Uh, you did mention um, in Colombo that um, as Britain and Sri Lanka are working closely together, that the parliaments of Britain and Sri Lanka uh, are working closely. Um, there could be certain gaps in the parliamentary si system that need bridging. Um, what are we talking about here? I think um, the question, what are, we, what are we talking about or where are the gaps, is, is one which is uh, best answered by Sri Lankan parliamentarians uh, and by the Sri Lankan people. Uh, what I can do is tell you a little bit about how we have been working together. Uh, we do it, uh, we, we've certainly been supporting uh, the work, for example, of the Westminster Foundation for Democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're keen to support the work of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, 
We've had Sri Lankan parliamentarians and official senior officials from Parliament here travelling to Westminster in London to see how at sea look here, how we do things. Uh, and we've had members of the British Parliament, both the House of Lords and the House of Commons, again coming with senior officials from our system in Westminster uh, to, to Parliament here in Sri Lanka. Um, one, one area of work that uh, we've, been, we've uh, been sharing ideas on uh, is how we develop, uh, how we have developed our system of cross-party committees uh, in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a reasonably new system in, in, in the UK and it's developed quickly as a concept and I think is now seen as one which uh, is, brings great value uh, to Parliament's uh, role in reviewing and asking proper questions of the executive in particular. Because clearly members of parliament, whether they're uh, members of the ruling party uh, or uh, members of an opposition party, have a responsibility to their voters, to the Sri Lankan electorate as a whole, to help, uh, to help uh, parliament play its part in, uh, in the good government of the country. Uh, and in a system where you divide up powers, as we, as we both do, between executive, legislature, judiciary, then that role of the legislature of parliament mm -hmm. in holding the executive, the government to account is an important one. Uh, like I said, you've been here and uh, for four and a half years, uh, sufficient time to understand the Sri Lankan system, I suppose, in a certain way. Um, the, the executive powers in Sri Lanka, this is a continued debate. Um, as an outsider to the political system here and how you look at Sri Lanka, uh, what do you think about the executive powers? Uh, of course, we had the 19th Amendment brought in, uh, which, which curtailed certain uh, powers of the executive and passed it on to the parliament. Uh, but what more needs to be done? Should we retain the executive or should it be a parliamentary-based one? Should, should there be a stronger prime minister? Um, I like your view, um, because you've been here and you've been a part of uh, what's happening in Sri Lanka. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a question I'm slightly wary of offering an answer to because it's clearly a politically uh, hot topic at, um, at the moment. But at the end of the day, what we, what we all, what I think we knew, in each of our countries we have an ambi ambition to put in place a system of government that works well. If you look across Europe, you see very different styles of government from, for example, in, in France, quite an executive presidential style of government. Uh, through to a, a, a system which in some ways is significantly different uh, with, with the Prime Minister uh, in the United Kingdom. But I think at the end of the day the, the, the objective is to set up a system which works well for the country. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's time we take a short commercial break here at Hyde Park. We'll return to talk more. Welcome back at Hyde Park. We're talking to the uh, British High Commissioner in Sri Lanka, James Doris, joining us here to discuss about UK-Sri Lanka relations and, of course, his uh, tenure here in Sri Lanka as the, uh, the UK diplomat represented in Sri Lanka. Um, Shortly after the uh, Easter attacks again, I go back to the discussion we had uh, at the same place um, about the post uh, uh, the aftermath of the Easter attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, following that, you have been engaged in a lot of discussion in terms of meeting the Mahanayaka Theras, leaders of uh, religious communities in the country. Um, what have your primary goals been in these meetings and discussions that you've had with uh, uh, all these religious leaders in the country? Many of the, you're right. I've, I've talked um, about uh, interfaith issues uh, with many, uh, many leaders, both political and religious leaders. I've been doing that um, throughout my time here, throughout the past four years in Sri Lanka. Uh, my call on the Mahanayakas, the Malwatta and Askiriya Mahanayakas in Kandy, was really as I come to the uh, end of my um, time in Sri Lanka, my first official visit outside uh, Colombo back in 2015 was to Kandy, and I. Uh, I pay calls on the two Mahanayakas then 
and uh, it was a pleasure and an honour to do so uh, last week, my final official call uh, outside Colombo. Yeah. Uh, but a point um, that I've talked about with them, I've talked about it with the Roman Catholic Cardinal, I've talked about it with other faith leaders, and as I say, with uh, politicians in different parties, as well as with business leaders, uh, is the role that leaders in society have for helping uh, draw communities together and helping build trust and that applies as much to political as to religious as to business leaders um, and unfortunately we have seen some people a small number of people yes but some people in positions of importance who have been saying things uh, which have been frankly unhelpful yeah. um, sometimes people seem to do it for uh, reasons of short-term political gain or political convenience um, but it comes at potential real cost and I think the more that people can join up around this national need to help bind the communities together to build trust, inspire confidence, uh, that's the way everyone needs to go. We've been talking about face masks, uh, the, the burqa and um, certain different legislations for different faiths. Now this is a continued debate in Sri Lanka, the Muslim Marriage um, and Divorce Act. Um, this kind of legislation, what is your view uh, in terms of having um, such legislation for a particular community in the country? Um, you talk about the Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act and, and, and other similar sorts. As far as I know, the Muslim and Marriage and Divorce Act is a particular piece of legislation uh, which, only, which applies to the Muslim community only, and for viewers who aren't familiar with it, amongst other things, it uh, permits the marriage of Muslim children uh, as young as the age of 12, and it sets up a separate system of rules uh, for divorce and for uh, decisions on custody of children, uh, for example. Um, I would say, and we say in the UK, that the law is for everyone. There is one law and the same law for everyone. Uh, and it's a law which, um, at a secular level, does not distinguish between communities by reason of different people's faiths. I think that uh, almost all of your viewers uh, will agree that 12, frankly, is too young to marry. Uh, and we, that is the state and the law, have a responsibility to protect, uh, to protect young children from marriage at a, I would say, inappropriately young age. And I would welcome the, I do welcome the uh, reflection that I know from uh, conversations with uh, many Muslim friends is taking place within the community um, about change to the uh, Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act. I think what um, we'll all instinctively understand is that uh, change which if, uh, particularly affects one community is best led from uh, within that community and uh, it avoids the sense that uh, a change which not everyone might welcome is being imposed from the outside. Um, but I think that's really positive uh, within the community. Um, I also think it's really important uh, to involve particularly women in this debate. I've talked to uh, women Muslim leaders in communities um, around the country. I was in Katangudi uh, talking with uh, women leaders only recently. Uh, and particularly given how this law uh, affects them and how divorce laws affect them, uh, you know, they're, they're thought, they are thoughtful and their voice counts for a lot. And again, I would uh, encourage everyone to ensure that that voice is properly included in both the private and the public debate. Marriage at 12, age 12, uh, this is suddenly against uh, the universal right of a child and um, other international laws that Sri Lanka is uh, also signatory to. Um, but hasn't the UK raised any concern about uh, the continuation of these uh, legal systems in Sri Lanka, the ability for these laws to be practiced in the country, especially when it uh, hinders the right of a child and uh, women violates, not just hinders, it violates? Um, as I say, I regularly uh, talk about a whole set of issues uh, which touch on human rights. Uh, in support of in support of those who are, are encouraging change uh, invariably uh, and the uh, MMDA the Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act is as I say a piece of legislation I've discussed uh, with many people uh, during my time my time here as British High Commissioner um, but as a country will the United Kingdom look at uh, any further uh, dialogue or maybe even um, to press Sri Lanka to to get rid of uh, such le legislation as I say, I do think these, best, uh, these debates are best led from within the country. We can offer advice, we can share views uh, as friends. Um, but as we know, this, um, the, 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 the story, that's the picture that some people like to paint 
uh, of hostile international interference is, is, is wrong. Uh, it's something we certainly, my government, works very carefully to avoid. So I think that while we're happy to contribute to a discussion, uh, if, if our views are sought, um, that, that ambition for change needs to come within, and particularly from within affected communities. Um, so the fact that there is a real discussion about this and about other issues, uh, and the, 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 the Freedom of Information Act uh, is one I mentioned earlier, uh, is, is, is encouraging. I do think that that's where um, these debates really need to be led and driven from. They need to be led and driven from the inside. Uh, particularly even after the war, the UK, the United States, as well as European nations uh, came together to hold Sri Lanka accountable for certain um, the allegations of war crimes um, and, uh, and uh, violations of human rights. Can you not take a look at uh, issues as a violation of a child's right here uh, through the implementation of a law that, that, that is not compatible with international laws uh, to be taken up to press a country to uh, rid these laws of that nation uh, so that uh, all human beings, whether they're Muslim, Buddhist, uh, Catholic or Hindus, are able to uh, are subject to one law within the country? Um, as I say, we regularly do raise it, and I think just through raising, raising topics, uh, we, we, we set out our views and our hopes. And another area which you haven't mentioned is the death penalty. Mm -hmm. It's another topic that I've been talking about, and um, I know many other uh, ambassadors and high commissioners in Sri Lanka have also been talking about um, as, as, as an area of concern. Um, at the end of the day, it's Sri Lanka's sovereign decision whether or not to implement the death penalty, but we very much hope, as we have made consistently clear, that the long-standing moratorium on the use of the death penalty uh, will be maintained here. Um, I'm sure viewers will have, uh, will have seen that uh, last week uh, a group of MPs put forward a proposal uh, to abolish the death penalty, to take it out of those statutes which still provide for it. I would say that's a welcome, welcome initiative, not least because a lot of research from around the world shows that the death penalty is not an effective deterrent for the sorts of uh, crimes uh, it's often uh, provided for as a possible sentence. I'd like to go back to our discussion about the change of constitution, parliamentary system. Um, uh, since 2015's uh, 15 change in government, uh, Sri Lanka has been talking about bringing in a new constitution, and there has been constant debate about uh, um, certain wordings in the draft document, uh, whether there's prominence given to Buddhists as the majority uh, community, um, and uh, certain minorities also have been raising concern. But uh, my question is whether Britain has been able to give any pointers to Sri Lanka in tackling this matter. Again, slightly as with some of my answers, I think the drafting of a constitution is very much for uh, Sri Lanka and for uh, Sri Lankans and for the people you elect to take these important decisions. Um, so no, I mean, if, we, if, 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 you, if our views were wanted, uh, we're, we're, we're generally happy to offer views, but I do think that the wording of our constitution uh, is particularly special for a country as that supreme overriding uh, document. Right, I think it's time we take a short commercial break at Hyde Park. We'll return with more. We did speak about uh, Buddhism, um, the majority and minorities, but um, the question uh, particularly about uh, the country's majority feeling threatened, especially through the draft of a new constitution and certain legislation. Uh, how do you look at this? The constitution at the moment provides that um, all religions um, have an equal place, but the place of Buddhism is special in Sri Lanka. Um, I would say that um, Sri Lanka is in many ways a uh, successful example of a multi-faith, multi-ethnic society. Of course, as we all know, uh, it's had its problems. But when I look around Colombo and I see the harmony uh, with which people of four great faiths live together, it's a really good example for lots of places in the world uh, where there are real problems. 
I think it's also important, though, that um, all of us, you know, be we from a majority or a minority community, uh, understand that uh, concerns run both ways. It's important, of course, for the majority community in a country to uh, recognise that uh, minority communities will quite reasonably feel concerned about some things that are different about them but important to them. It's equally important that uh, small communities remember that um, there are things which are important to the majority community too. I think it's a point which really goes back to the point I was making earlier about reconciliation uh, and the recipe for success uh, lying in everyone, uh, showing that understanding and tolerance and more than that ambition uh, to live together as friends and to celebrate uh, difference uh, as opposed to making it a cause of uh, political or other conflict. Um, from what we see, Britain e will uh, exit the, the EU without a deal. That's what we see here. Um, maybe you'd have uh, a little more to add to that. Either way, there has been a lot of discussion about entering free trade agreements and preferential trade um, agreements with certain nations. But what is it for Sri Lanka? How far has the, the discussion about uh, a particular trade agreement between the United Kingdom and Sri Lanka worked out so far? Can I pick up on your first point first? Um, I can't say that we will leave uh, without a deal. Um, our new Prime Minister Boris Johnson, uh, as part of his uh, campaign to be elected the new leader of the uh, Conservative Party, did make clear that uh, if there were no other option, then the UK will leave the European Union on or before the 31st of October, deal or no deal. Uh, I think that what um, pretty much everyone in the UK would also say is that a good deal is better than no deal. Uh, but, of course, uh, time is uh, running short. Um, on trade, um, the UK's ambition after it leaves the European Union uh, will be, uh, as it has long, uh, long been doing, to advocate for and promote free trade um, around the world. And we will be looking for the opportunity in Brexit to uh, develop uh, our trade and investment relationships with countries everywhere, particularly with long-standing friends, uh, and Sri Lanka is uh, one of those. Um, but uh, in terms of negotiations, uh, we heard about the government, uh, um, trade ministry, uh, and the government uh, talking about uh, ongoing discussions. But has there any progress been made about a particular trade, a preferential trade uh, arrangement between the UK and Sri Lanka? Because in terms of uh, exports, nearly three billion US dollars worth of goods are directed to the European Union, and of which uh, the United Kingdom is a major trading partner for Sri Lanka. What I can say is that there is no ongoing specific Sri Lanka UK trade agreement uh, taking place uh, at the moment. Uh, the sort of basis, in a sense, for that agreement will become a little clearer once we know um, what terms the UK has left the EU on. Uh, what I can say, though, is that the ambition on the UK side to develop uh, trade in both directions and investment uh, will be undimmed. Um, you have been talking a lot about uh, the ease of doing business here. Very recently, too, um, at the launch of an, um, yes. a report, you did mention about work that Sri Lanka need to do in order to improve the doing business um, environment for investors. How far have we come? Let's, let's revisit your thoughts there and very briefly talk about uh, the challenges we face and what Sri Lanka needs to do right now to put this right. Because FDI at this point is very important for Sri Lanka, as you pointed out then. Very good. Yes, it wasn't just me hypothesizing. I was um, drawing, drawing points from the position of Sri Lanka on the most recent uh, World Bank Ease of Doing Business Index. Um, Sri Lanka ranks um, 100th out of fewer than 200 countries, uh, so is in the lower half of countries around the world for the ease of doing business. Uh, and I was commenting, uh, in, 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 uh, taking account too of discussions that I've had with many businessmen, British, Sri Lankan and from other countries, about some of the problems that they face uh, doing and developing business here and the sorts of changes that they would like to see. And topics that regularly come up include uh, market liberalisation, mm -hmm. um, so opening the market up to uh, competition, include uh, reducing the amount of red tape uh, that's in place, uh, simplifying um, pro laws around property ownership, having a more uh, dependable uh, system for enforcement of commercial agreements. 
that, uh, that last one being one area where Sri Lanka scores particularly lowly in the uh, World Bank assessment. Mm -hmm. um, is there any scope for uh, improvement in relations, particularly trade and investment, with, between the UK and Sri Lanka? Um, is, it, is it essential um, that we put certain things right here in the island or are there areas that you just raised as concerning? Uh, should those be addressed? I think um, it's in the country's, country's interest, own interests, to move forward in all of these areas. And I don't think that um, British companies are exceptional. The concerns that British companies have and British investors have who are considering making investments here uh, will be the same or very similar to those uh, of investors from uh, other countries and also, of course, Sri Lankan investors. Uh, because part of the key to success for Sri Lanka uh, needs to lie in attracting Sri Lankan capital uh, into growing businesses here. Uh, we've seen a number of important Sri Lankan companies deciding to uh, invest and develop operations for good reasons um, outside Sri Lanka. But if Sri Lanka were able to draw that Sri Lankan money in, as well as international money in, uh, not through force of law, but through offering um, an attractive environment for doing business, then that would be a really important achievement. Um, I think with investment, it's, it's worth remembering that this is an international competition uh, and businesses have free choices and uh, they choose to invest in places where uh, the rationale is strongest for them. Um, so as um, the Sri Lankan government authorities, businesses uh, look at the challenges they face, I think remembering that this is part of an international competition is, is going to be important. Um, talking about trade uh, between the United Kingdom and Sri Lanka, um, a controversial topic uh, uh, on the news in recent times has been the 272 tons of garbage that were re-exported to Sri Lanka. Um, of course, it's a lot of controversy with uh, talk um, around uh, the country and in this part of the world about uh, garbage being dumped from uh, Western nations into developing countries. But what is the UK's view about this? Because it's very clear that there has been some sort of transaction ongoing um, in, in, in uh, these containers being brought to Sri Lanka and how it came to Sri Lanka, what channels. Um, yes, an investigation has been launched, but let's hear about, uh, through you, what the UK thinks about this. I'd start off by saying that clearly waste management is important in all of our countries. We, we live in a, in, a, in a world today where mankind is generating huge amounts of waste. Uh, and the international trade in waste uh, is important and it is generally uh, legitimate. Um, some countries are good at processing some things and are able to make money out of it and that's clearly welcome. Um, I think it's also important to say though that um, countries have rules. Sri Lanka has rules and the UK has rules both for the export and the import of waste. Uh, and those rules are put there for good reason. And it's important that people who are engaged in the international trade of, or in the, in the international business of moving waste around, do comply with both the exporting countries and the importing countries' rules and regulations. Um, our rules are clear, and if uh, any company uh, misdescribes the waste that it is exporting in order to obtain an export license, then the law provides both for imprisonment and for heavy fines. Uh, have, have, have you had any insight into the investigation that is ongoing um, and the progress of this? Because this has been a concern for Sri Lanka in terms of uh, when Sri Lanka uh, managing the country's own garbage was an issue. We, we uh, had a tragedy a few years ago uh, when the Mitharamulla garbage dump collapsed. Also about uh, tons of garbage being re-exported. The investigations, have you focused on that? Um, as I say, I probably don't know much more than many of your readers, and I, I mean in less than some of your viewers. I mean in less than some of them, um, having 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 learned about de some of this detail uh, through reading the papers and listening to the news here. Um, what I can say is that, uh, and it's um, some, a point I've already made, uh, is that our experts from our own department for the environment um, are working with and talking with uh, responsible Sri Lankan officials. Uh, so that we are, we, we are happy to uh, contribute uh, information from our end to help people here understand 
uh, what the story is and uh, how to move forward. I'm sure this is also um, a topic of interest for you because you have always been adv advocating for um, protection of the environment. You're an environmentalist, um, loves nature, and of course we, we know that you um, love bird watching too. <laughs> um, in Sri Lanka, I hope you got to do um, got to explore most of your uh, hobbies here. Uh, but finally, before we wrap up, I'd just like to ask you a little about superpowers uh, jostling for position in Sri Lanka, the United States, uh, India and China. What is the United Kingdom's take here? Well, that's a very different question from a conservation question. <laughs> I thought you were going to ask me about maintaining the balance between uh, conservation and the need to protect Sri Lanka's national parks <laughs> with the ambition to develop tourist numbers and tourist revenue. Uh, but on the Indian Ocean, the, the, uh, the UK has uh, long had uh, an interest uh, in this part of the world, um, both because the Indian and Pacific Oceans are surrounded by countries uh, that, uh, the, the, with which we are good friends, um, also because uh, increasingly today as uh, trade and the world as a whole becomes more and more international, uh, issues like maritime security, effective fisheries conservation, um, free trade through waterways, etc., uh, become more important and legitimate interests of all of us. Um, the UK uh, is, a, is a major contributor to development uh, in this part of the world, so looking at South Asia, um, we've, we, we've contributed a lot of overseas development assistance, particularly to India, to Bangladesh, Pakistan and uh, Nepal. Uh, but you certainly do find yourselves um, at, a, at, a, at a geographical position uh, in the world, which is undoubtedly important, and we see that uh, in the development, for example, of Hambantota and Colombo Port City, um, at a time, obviously, of increasing uh, international ambition, if I can call it that. Uh, something uh, that I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about is tourism, as you pointed out. Uh, um, the, an industry which was hardly hit uh, during um, and after the Easter attacks, but there is a scope for Sri Lanka to develop this industry uh, to, so, so that uh, the industry would be a greater beneficiary for Sri Lanka's uh, march forward in achieving higher GDP growth. What do we do now? As you say, the uh, industry uh, was hit uh, very hard and continues to be hard hit. I was talking to leading hoteliers just last week and uh, they commented that occupancy levels are still well below uh, where they would like them to be. And the impact of this goes widely. It, of course, goes to the hotels themselves. It also goes to the, the fishermen and the farmers who sell their produce to the hotels and uh, for whom there is a smaller, uh, a smaller market when there aren't so many tourists. I do think the challenge here, or an important challenge, uh, is around how you keep um, ambitions in balance. The ambition, yes, to grow tourist numbers, but also looking not just at absolute numbers of f footfall, um, but also at the sort of people you want to attract to the country uh, and what revenue they will bring in, but keeping that in balance with um, conservation needs. The conservation is partly around the great historic sites, Sigiriya and Radapura, Polnaroa. You know, how do you um, ensure that the right number of people are visiting in order to make, uh, in order to maintain what is special about those places? Uh, but perhaps even more than them uh, is is the conservation of uh, your great national parks, which are an important part not just of Sri Lankan heritage, but frankly of mankind's heritage. Uh, and how you take steps that, yes, allow people to uh, enjoy and appreciate these extraordinary experiences uh, that Sri Lanka has to offer, while also having in place rules that are um, strictly uh, policed, maintained, to ensure that these will be there for future generations as well. Thank you very much for your thoughts, and we wish you all the very best in your journey back to England. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. We have with us uh, the British High Commissioner in Sri Lanka, James Doris, joining us at Hyde Park. We'll see you again next week at the same time with yet another discussion.